Hey guys, welcome to Digit.in and what we are going to talk about today is how we at Digit test TVs. Now, while a subjective analysis of how content looks on TV is important, we go a step further and objectively analyze the performance of the TV using some specialized hardware. Now, what we have out here is a setup of how we test most of the TVs. What we have is a portrait displays Calman software married to a Video Forge Pro connected to the C6 colorometer which tells us a lot of accurate readings about the TV from its color accuracy to its peak brightness, black levels and a lot more. So before we get deep into how we do these tests, let me first quickly run you to what we have out here. The C6 colorometer actually reads the colors being represented on the TV and tells the software if those colors are accurate or not. But who is generating these accurate colors? And that's where the Video Forge Pro comes into place. It is connected to the television via an HDMI cable. And of course, that HDMI source is switched on. And the colorometer is reading the colors that are being sent by the Video Forge. And the Video Forge is also telling the software which colors it's sending, what it's sending to the TV and whether those readings are accurate or not. So what do we judge with all this? So let's start off with the simple thing, which is SDR content, which is in standard dynamic range. You have a lot of content on streaming services in SDR. Now, uh, peak brightness is very important. And since a lot of SDR content is mastered in 100 nits, we know that even high-end TVs or mid-tier TVs don't need to go above 125 nits of peak brightness for SDR content simply because, like I said, SDR content is mastered in 100 nits. And of course, the 25% headroom is to compensate for the ambient light in your room. But when it comes to HDR content, peak brightness is a different game altogether. We've seen budget TVs that have peak brightnesses from 280, 300, 350, and 400 nits of brightness. And some of the higher end TVs go on from 500, 600, 700 nits, and even 1000 nits of peak brightness. Brightness. So why is peak brightness so important in HDR? And I can sum it up for you in two words, specular highlights. Now, what are specular highlights? So let's say if you have a bright sun with, let's say, a bird coming in front of it or tube lights in a scene of a particular movie, which is mastered in HDR, you need to be able to see all the details that are present in these bright images represented on the TV. So the higher the peak brightness, the more these specular highlights are visible, which is why it is really important to have a higher peak brightness in an HDR TV. But peak brightness is not the only thing. You also need to keep in mind the black luminance of the TV, which is essentially how the TV can represent the color black. For example, an OLED TV has self-emitting pixels, so it can uh, represent the color black most accurately. And we've seen the black luminance on a lot of OLED TVs go down to zero to show you true black. Now, we've also seen TVs like full array backlit TVs, which have local dimming zones represent the color black very well and come very close to the mark of giving you a zero black luminance level, simply because if there is black in the area where the LEDs can be shut off in that dimming zone, they do get shut off to give you a better representation of the color black. Now, most TVs, especially in the budget segment, do not have uh, local dimming, so they try to mimic the color black with their backlighting, which is where you get to see haloing or blooming effects uh, when you consume content in the dark. So for example, if there's a moon in a scene surrounded by complete darkness of the sky, in a pitch dark room, you may notice that the black actually looks a little gray and that's because the TV does not have dimming zones and it is trying to mimic the color black. This is where peak brightness and black luminance is very important to judge the performance of a TV. But that's not all the software tells us. We also judge the color accuracy. Now, color accuracy is measured in two ways. One is in standard dynamic range and in HDR. For SDR content, we look at the REC 709 container. And for HDR content, we look at the REC 2020 or the BT color, uh, BT 2020 color space to see how well the TV can show you a wider color gamut. Now, according to the software, no TV can achieve a delta error of one or below. Remember, the lower the delta error, the better the performance in colors of this TV. And a lot of high-end TVs really do come close. And the closer the TV comes to the number one in terms of its delta errors, the better its performance. Now, because you will watch a wide variety of content on the TVs, we use the different presets in the TVs to judge the type of content. For example, we've noticed that the cinema or the movie preset is usually the more color accurate preset. And it gives you more natural looking colors in a slightly warmer tone, which is how the the content was meant to be viewed, but you're not only going to watch movies on your TV, are you? Which is why we have presets like the standard preset, which may have a higher delta error, but they are the ideal settings to use 
when consuming everyday content like let's say news or even some TV shows. So while we do check for the absolute color accuracy of different picture presets, we also match it to the real world content with different picture presets to see which one gives you the best overall experience. Now moving away from the color accuracy, the third thing that we derive from this software and hardware put together is the grayscale tracking. Put simply, grayscale tracking tells us how accurate the color white is at different brightness levels of the TV. This is important because the content you will watch on your TV is not always at a static brightness. The brightness of the content keeps varying depending on the content and the color white needs to be most accurate so that the other colors are represented correct as well. As you can see on this graph, there is an RGB balance as well that we look at and the closer the balance is to the center line, the better the color performance of the TV at different brightness levels. Now this is every Everything that we use the Calman software and hardware to judge the objective performance of the TV in terms of peak brightness, black luminance, color accuracy and grayscale tracking. But it's also about consuming content on the TV and once we've got all this information from the Calman, we fire up some real world content in all possible formats. So that's standard dynamic range, HDR10 if the TV supports it, HDR10 plus and Dolby Vision and see how this content is represented based on the findings we get from our Calman. We use a lot of real world content from not only streaming services but content that we have at our disposal as well to judge the performance of this TV. Now moving away from the picture quality, sound is something that a lot of people also care about on the TV and when it comes to our audio testing, we have a Dolby Atmos disc which has the Dolby Atmos content you've probably experienced in a theater. So if you've gone to a Dolby Atmos theater, you know that leaf falling from the sky demo or the rain demo that you get to give you the immersive experience of speakers above you. We have those demos in their full fidelity and we play them on these TVs to check for things like channel separation, surround sound effects and a lot more more to judge how well the speakers can generate different types of audio. Of course, after we've done this, we do play some real world content as well, specifically mastered in Dolby Atmos or surround sound to see the better level of channel separation that each TV can bring. That was about the audio test. Now moving on to something that a lot of you enjoy what we test about is gaming. Now when it comes to gaming, we use a PS5 to test the gaming performance of the TV. A lot of TVs today come with HDMI 2.1, which means you get features like auto low latency mode, variable refresh rate and a 4K at 120 Hz. While the PS5 yet does not support variable refresh rate, we do get a better understanding of the other features the TVs bring. One thing to keep note of when we have an HDMI 2.1 enabled TV is to see whether it supports RGB HDR and in some cases we've noticed some TVs that bring HDMI 2.1 only support YUV 422 HDR which means they do not come with a full HDMI 2.1 bandwidth. Some TVs that claim HDMI 2.1 also come with a peak frame rate of 60 hertz and not 120 hertz what a HDMI 2.1 enabled TV is capable of. So all this information is generated through the system settings of the PlayStation 5. We also calibrate the brightness of the PlayStation 5 to the television and we play a bunch of games to see how the HDR performance on the TV is. Dirt 5 is a great example because it is an 8G IG game which not only gives us good HDR performance on the TV but also tells us whether the calibration of the TV with the console is correct or not. And trust me when I tell you we've noticed a lot of TVs give you a higher HDR calibration but the real world performance really isn't there which helps us understand how to to better calibrate the TV for playing games. In addition to Dirt 5, there are a bunch of games that look spectacular on the PlayStation 5 like Spider-Man Miles Morales, Ghost of Tsushima and so many more that really bring out the details in a very good HDR TV and we use these games to judge the performance of the TV in terms of not only their visuals but what it's like to experience the sound of these games and also play them and judge the input lag. Now not all TVs uh, support HDMI 2.1 and the ones that support HDMI 2.0 and HDMI 1.4 we scale back the testing using the same console to judge the performance of HDMI 2.0 features and HDMI 1.4 features based on what the TV has on offer. Next up is the user interface and we've seen a lot of TVs come with different UIs. We have LG bringing its WebOS, we have Sony with Google TV and a number of other brands bringing uh, different UIs like Xiaomi has its own patch wall in addition to Android TV. To judge the UI, we do a number of things like navigate it at its full speed. But before we get into all that, what we do is check for any software or firmware update for the television itself and also for the apps that are installed, be it streaming services or other apps available on the TV. 
Once it's updated, we navigate the UI as much as possible to see for any lags. And one trick that we use to see whether the uh, TV lags or not is open Amazon Prime Video and use the Google Assistant to open a particular show on Netflix and vice versa. And this helps us judge not only the app switching capabilities of the TV, considering these two are pretty heavy apps, but also helps us understand the voice recognition capabilities of the TV. So that was a quick look or a rather an in-depth look at how we at Digit test TVs. Like I said at the beginning, while subjective tests are very important to let us know how the content you enjoy on TVs should look on the TV, it is the objective testing we do that not only gives us a better understanding of the performance of the TV, but also helps us in recommending the right TV for you. So there you have it guys, that was our in-depth look at how we test TVs at Digit. For more from the world of technology, you can subscribe to the channel. We will catch you in another video. It's goodbye for now.